Hey everyone, welcome back to RPG Imaginings. Today I'm going to do a little reminiscing on a role-playing game that was one of the first that I really spent a significant amount of time not only playing, but also the very first game that I game mastered. And that is West End Games edition of Star Wars role-playing game. And I think it's pretty apropos to do this right now, because some of you may know that Fantasy Flight Games has the license for... Uh, West End Games old products, well, specifically Fantasy Flight Games has the Star Wars license, and somehow, ipso facto, they were able to put out uh, new uh, 25th anniversary editions of West End Games Star Wars role-playing game. And Star Wars has gone through many role-playing games since West End Games Star Wars role-playing, but um, Star this is Star Wars' first role-playing game. It first came out in 1987. You can see that this book that I own is the second edition revised and expanded. This particular volume came out in uh, 1994 and um, this was the second role-playing game that I ever bought and ever played after Dungeons and Dragons second edition I had bought uh, my Dungeons and Dragons second edition books in uh, the early 90s when I was a teen and like many gamers my parents took them away from me because you know they're of the devil uh, and when I was 18, because, you know, turning 18 is some sort of magical, mystical maturity number, uh, those games were given back to me. And uh, then when I graduated high school, we had uh, trekked down to Milwaukee, because I'm from southeastern Wisconsin. And so uh, I was lucky enough when I first entered college that uh, computers had become affordable enough, and I had worked really hard through high school to get scholarships, that uh, I was able to bring a personal computer to college, which um, I, I wouldn't say was a, it was definitely an uncommon thing. I mean, uh, there were a lot of, uh, I went to the University of Wisconsin for my undergrad, and uh, there were a lot of students there that had computers, but by and large, uh, purchasing a computer for the classroom was like a big deal. Uh, at the time. And so we went down to Milwaukee to purchase my first personal computer for use at school. And while we were there, Gen Con was going on. And Gen Con started in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Uh, it moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, Gen Con is currently in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I lived close to Milwaukee the entire time that I was growing up. But the internet was just a brand new thing, and in my uh, hometown, which was a small town, very conservative, there wasn't a lot of news about gaming, partly because gaming was not seen as something quote-unquote healthy for kids to do. And so I had never heard of Gen Con before, and so on our way down to Milwaukee, I asked... Uh, my mom and my stepdad, if we could stop at Gen Con, and they agreed, and I wasn't there for long, I was only there for like an hour, but the first booth that attracted to me, that, that attracted me at my very first Gen Con was the West End Games booth. And West End Games is known for several games. It's it's no longer a company. It is defunct. Uh, it had been sold off over the early, over the 2000s and is no longer a company. It's called West End Games because it was named after the West End Bar in New York City where it was first uh, founded near Columbia University. And uh, West End Games is known for Paranoia, a very famous comedic role-playing game. It's known for Torg, which I also played Torg in college as well. And uh, finally, uh, DC Universe, I think, had a role-playing game that was put up by West End Games. And then where West End Games really made its mark, though, was in the Star Wars role-playing game. And I mean, since then, Wizards of the Coast had taken over the Star Wars license for a very, very long time and put out two versions of a Star Wars role-playing game. Fantasy Flight Games currently has the license for Star Wars role-playing games. But West End Games is the one that started it all. And... Not only was this my first Gen Con and the the um, uh, first uh, experience that I had at that uh, great convention, uh, but this uh, particular set of books that I want to showcase in this video are really special to me because it was... I would say the first time that I really got to interact with a game publisher, and it was a really positive experience. And so not only do I have my revised and expanded second edition of Star Wars role-playing game from West End Games, but I also have my Thrawn trilogy source book, which you can see has been loved over the years as, as I've read it and reread it and used it uh, in Star Wars uh, uh, Wedge. And um, 
So yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead and tell the story of what happened. So I get into Gen Con, never having been there before. I was like, oh my gosh, there are people who like what I like and are not shaming me for liking what I like. Uh, and I was attracted to the West End Games book because I've always loved Star Wars. I mean, I, you know, I've showcased the tattoo, I think, several times in the reviews here on the, the channel. Uh, so here we have the Rebel Phoenix uh, is my only tattoo that I have currently. Uh, and... So I got to check, I, I got to talk to the author of both of these supplements, well, one of the authors. So one of the authors is Eric S. Troutman. And he was so nice to me as a young 18-year-old kid coming up to the booth um, with limited money. You know, I just graduated high school. I had a little bit of graduation money uh, boiling a, a hole in my, or burning a hole in my pocket. And um, I... Uh, uh, I was really interested in, of course, getting the core book for the role-playing game, but, you know, what really resurrected Star Wars in the early 90s was the Thrawn trilogy, uh, which was published by Tim the author Timothy Zahn, and they came out, you know, just within a couple years of each other, and I had read all of them, and I still consider them to be amongst the best Star Wars fiction uh, that has published, uh, and the Thrawn trilogy was a continuation of, like, what happened after Return of the Jedi. It was like a big deal the Star Wars fans in the early 90s because we hadn't had any new Star Wars in a really long time. Um, George Lucas sort of put it to bed with Return of the Jedi and then he basically didn't touch it other than to doing the licensing for these books. And so I'm like, wow, there's like a source book where you can, in a role-playing game, you know, work out all the different aspects that you read about in the Thrawn trilogy. I just thought that that was the most unbelievably the coolest thing. And, uh... You know, Eric S. Troutman wrote both of these, was a contributing author on both of these books, although I think he was a main author here in the Thrawn Trilogy source book. Um, if we turn to the copy page, this is so old that I'm having difficulty even separating the pages. Where is the author page on this? There we go. And so, yeah, Eric S. Uh, Troutman was one of the original designers on this, as well as Bill Slavizek, who was uh, heavily involved in Star Wars role-playing game in its... Uh in its mid game. So anyway, I actually got to talk to the author of the books. He could see how excited I was. Uh, I think retail costs for both of these books combined at the time was $55 and he cut me a little break and I paid 45. And so I got a discount and I got two books that I really thought were awesome and cool. And so, um, those sort of stories of getting young guys, um, or women into the hobby, I think is that what Gen Con is all about. And uh, it was really impactful for me. And so let's just take a little tour down memory lane of Star Wars role-playing game and, and see what we have here. And so one thing that really impressed me with the book right out of the gate is that it was in full color with glossy pages, which was not a common thing uh, at the time, uh, especially for small publishers. And so they really put some really high production values into this book. Uh, and I immediately thought that this was interesting because sort of the... Um, flavor of this role-playing book is that you got you have this bounty hunter guy who's sort of uh, named Blaine Handsome uh, or I'm sorry Blaine Handsome is like the example of a uh, initial character that someone was make this bounty hunter guy which is introduced here uh, at the first page of the of the character section um uh, this bounty hunter guy sort of is walking you through the character creation process and asking you, you know, a lot of questions like, what do you want your character to be able to do? Stuff like that. Um, Star Wars role-playing was a D6 system, and West End Games was known for its D6 system, and so basically you would have a difficulty number that the GM would set based on uh, die 6, and every one of your attributes and every one of your skills was uh, based upon rolling a number of uh, six-sided die and then adding, if there are like extra pips, like right here it says 3D plus 1, well you'd roll 3D6 and add 1. And so West End Games uh, Star Wars was really accessible because everybody had all sorts of D6 lying around. And if you wanted to, you could cannibalize them from other board games um, if you didn't have access to like sets at game stores. Um, so it starts you off in the character creation process or to help you with understanding the role playing game with sort of a little choose your own adventure thing uh, here at the beginning. And uh, coming back to this real quick, part of the reason why I'm doing this right now is because Fantasy Flight Games released a uh, 25th anniversary set of this that I think is retailing for $60 that contains this original 
role-playing game book and I, th I want to say like the Rebel Alliance source book is part of it or something like that. And so if you're liking what you see here, this is a product that, that has been re-released. And so they have an example of play and uh, this is uh, they have a player handout here that you could photocopy, permission granted to photocopy for personal use, that you could hand out the basic rules all summarized to players so you could get them into the game. A couple pages here so you give them a little packet and then a blank character sheet and it delves right into creating characters. And the other thing about this book that I love is the flavor. The challenge this big is not for everyone. Join the Imperial Navy, a proud allegiance. And uh, so when I was watching Solo uh, a couple months ago, that was something that like really brought me back to the days of Wedge Star Wars because there was this recruitment for the uh, Empire in the background of one of the scenes. And so it takes you through how to make characters and wh what you want to, uh, what skills you might want to spend your initial skill points on. And the funny thing about West End Games Star Wars is it was known for you, like, needing to roll copious amounts of six-sided dies. And uh, in the early days of... In the early days of... Uh, min-maxing. People would just load up their D6s on certain skills and you'd be rolling this tremendous amount of dice to try to succeed at something. But um, really high production values here. I really like the layout of it that's just chocked full of, of great Star Wars photos from the movies as well as uh, uh, art to connect it back to the world. And another interesting thing I think about West End Games Star Wars is that it was considered canon by Lucasfilm. And so a lot of what was quote Quote unquote canonical in Star Wars from the uh, late 80s all the way up through the 2000s was based upon books that were produced by West End Games. And the West End Games writers not only got access to all this Star Wars material, books and, uh, uh, you know, the movies and TV shows to uh, help in their writing, but they also established a lot of early canon uh, for the Star Wars universe. And so we had a game master section helping you to understand how to game master the rules of the game, how combat works, how skills work. You know, standard role-playing stuff. Movement and chases, especially with spaceships, this is an important thing for an action-oriented game. And, you know, before Savage Worlds, which I think is one of the best action-oriented role-playing games out there right now, I would say that Wedge Star Wars was another just really action-oriented game that the nature of the rules and the way that the core rules were laid out was really geared towards action. And uh, not to say that Dungeons & Dragons wasn't geared towards action, but the purpose of this role-playing game was really so people could replicate every aspect of what they were seeing on the screen. Starships, chases, all that stuff. And so there's rules for different sensors for the spaceships, how space combat works. Uh, you, uh, there's section here on the Force, and so now we have a uh, young Jedi who's introducing us to the nature of the Force, and we were all like, she has a red lightsaber, what does that mean? And of course it didn't mean anything, it was just a choice for an artist. Um, and so all the details of, of the Force, and what was interesting about the Force in this system is that, you know, unlike a magic system where you'd have a num certain number of spells that you could quote-unquote cast, or uh, a, a certain number of uh, power points that you had to expend, uh, the way it worked is that you had three force skills in this game control alter and sense and then depending upon whether or not you could beat a difficulty you could do whatever you wanted with any of these powers uh and so that was uh, a, a really nifty aspect of this the first game that i gm'd was a uh, Tales of the Jedi era game and somewhere around here I don't have it right now I have my Tales of the Jedi source book which is arguably one of my most favorite source book that was based off of the Dark Horse comics uh, that came out for uh, Tales of the Jedi and so we ran a Tales of the Jedi campaign right as I was finishing up college and as I uh, entered my first like quote unquote real job we would uh, spend weekends uh, playing this Tales of the Jedi campaign and that was the first game that I ever GM'd and we had a lot of fun with this and so what I might do here is I might uh, tag some people who were uh, part of that game uh, because we still reminisce about it uh, periodically and so now here we are at the adventure section uh, it gives you a little advice on running adventures designing adventures Wanted for crimes against the Empire, these three rebel scum. You know, it's flavor like this that just made it awesome. Um, 
And so uh, Pirates of Prexiar is the the infamous uh, West End Games adventure that was included uh, to sort of uh, help you cut your teeth on GMing because this is laid out in you know three very simple encounters uh, in that you're you're uh, trying to go in and steal some cargo and you go in and you you try to get out and then there's a chase scene after it and then finally you get to this pirate corvette and uh the main villain is present there but the game recommends you know don't bring him out keep him to save for later and i think that as a narrative technique for a game master if you really want established villains you gotta establish your villains by having your villains escape and so uh, that was the the adventure that was included uh, with it. And then the uh, it's a little out of order here compared to modern supplements in that usually this universe section would come before. Usually in role-playing games, they put the adventure at the back of the book. So I think probably because as you're flipping through the pages, spoiler-wise, you'd want it near the back of the book. But they put it there, and then there was this universe section that has all the information about the Star Wars galaxy and uh, ugh, ugh, Alderaan destroyed. But here we have the New Republic symbol right here. Support the New Republic. Um, and so history of the galaxy, according to canon at the time, the slice where the majority of stuff happens. You can take a four-week grand galactic tour with galaxy tours. And I remember going uh, on the Star Tours ride at uh, Disney World with my parents and just thinking that was the bee's knees. Um, and so, yeah, just a lot of flavor here. So continuing on, how are you going to populate your world with interesting Game Master characters? What would typical enemies look like, whether bounty hunters or Imperials? Aliens and how to make them pay playable characters and what some of the advantages and disadvantages would be for different characters. You know, funny thing right here at this time while I was doing this, I ran a uh, website called Admiral Akbar's Homepage. Uh, home one and so back in the early days of the internet we you know had we had fan websites back in the mid 90s okay it was a thing um but we had them all on GeoCities, and so i ran a fan website for for admiral akbar uh and you can still find it in archives in various uh, locations on the web but um different creatures that you might encounter weapons and equipment you know all this standard stuff that would be in a adventure-esque sort of role-playing game how can you build droids what different types of droids were available vehicles excuse me starships the whole shebang is here and so uh i poured over this book Hours and hours just pouring over this book, rereading it, partly because I love games, partly because I love Star Wars. And so here at the back of the book, you have all sorts of sample characters if you want to, you know, get started really quickly and then just distribute some skill points. They do that for you. And of course, permission is granted to photocopy for personal use. Uh, and so, yeah, lots of lots of variety here of of uh, different characters that, that you can play. So that's it. This is the uh, core book for second edition revised and expanded that I think was released in 1994. And, but at the same time, I also got the Thrawn Trilogy source book, which contains everything that you would see in those three major books uh, that he wrote, uh, which uh, were uh, Heir to the Empire, Dark Force Rising, and uh, uh, The Last Command. And so um, you saw an introduction by Timothy Zahn, the original author of the books, introduction to the source book, and then what was Thrawn's deal? What was he trying to do? Uh, when we first started playing Wedge Star Wars, we were actually playing a Rebel Spec Forces game. So now that I think about it, about it, a Rebel Spec Forces game was the first game that I ever ran, and then that was followed by the Last Jedi uh, game that I did. And so this is a black and white book, uh, soft cover, perfect paperback. Um, Declaration of New Repu of the New Republic by Mon Mothma and Princess Leia Organa and Borsk Fele uh, from uh, the the main leader of uh, the Bothans on Cothless uh, and all the um, planetary systems that signed on to the New Republic. And then what I really appreciated about this book is that it had this organizational information about how the New Republic was organized, who the major figures were in it. Uh, all game stats for them, which when I was young, seeing game stats for my favorite characters was just the coolest thing. 
um, Rogue Squadron's Insignia and Hobby and Wedge. I also read all of the Rogue Squadron novels when they were released in the late 90s. And those were some of my favorite Star Wars novels. A new chapter on the Force reflecting not only the uh, famous character, uh, villainous character from the Thrawn trilogy, Joris Sabaoth, but uh, also um, some Force powers that were new and never be seen before seen in the Thrawn trilogy, and they're all statted out for West End Games Star Wars. Some cool Grand Admiral Thrawn's. I really like this. This is one of my favorite images from this book. Grand Admiral Thrawn's Armada. What was like the what was his picket line and close support and main battle line like uh, while he was trying to hold the Empire together after the disaster at Endor? Uh, so, just lots of information about the Imperial forces. Information about Talon Card, one of the coolest characters to have been created in the Thrawn trilogy. Uh, sort of this rogue rebel. He had Talon Card before. Before, uh, gosh, what's the name of the the new character in uh, the Rebel movie? I I can't believe that I'm blanking on this. Um, anyway, uh, the guy played by Forrest Whitaker. I can't believe that I'm blanking on him right now. Okay, I'm focused on this, and so I'm not focused on Star Wars uh, uh, lore right now. Uh, but um, uh, Forrest Whitaker's character is very similar to who Talon Card was uh, in the Thrawn trilogy. Um, and I believe they introduced him in the Rebels series, and he made an, an, an appearance in Rogue One. Um, it'll come to me. You know, I'm sure I'll get a billion comments on this. Well, not a billion. I'm sure I'll get a few comments in this video. People shocked that I can't remember the name of Forrest Whitaker's character. Um, but anyway, the, a lot of uh, these uh, famous uh, alternate rebel factions were... Uh, Saw Gerrera. Okay, see, I came up with it. And so I, I'm of the opinion that Saw Gerrera as a character is very similar to some characters that we had in the mid-90s like Garmbel Iblis and um, Talon Card is, is like those uh, fringe rebel factions. Um, haha, I came up with it. Okay. So there's all sorts of info about planetary systems that are present in the novels. Lots of info on these various... Uh, 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 new species that were detailed in the novels, especially the Sluisi, were especially interesting. These sort of like snake hammerhead-like creatures that were featured in it. And then speaking of creatures, all sorts of different creatures, including these anti-force force Vornskers, which were uh, sort of uh, Thrawn's attack dog, Sturm and Drang that he used, which are uh, obviously uh, German for th uh, thunder and lightning or storm and rain, maybe. I don't, I don't remember the exact translation, but um, something related to, to weather there. Um, and so he had these Vornskers that he was used to protect himself against force users because people couldn't use, uh, or they, they, they could... How is that different from the Salamari? Let's think about this. So the Salamari could push back the Force. Oh, and then the Vornskers couldn't be detected through the Force. That's what it was. And so we read these books and we're like, what? They're changing all the rules of the Force. And back then, it was all cool to us. Okay, gosh, there are a lot of toxic fans out there right now and it's driving me absolutely crazy. It's like you change aspects of Star Wars and they're like, this is not how Star Wars is. How dare you? Back then, because, you know, we had a sense of humor and a sense of wonder and I guess an imagination. And I'm not saying that things were better back then and I'm not saying people today don't, you know, know how to consume media or something. But I just would really like it if the toxic Star Wars fans would just ignore acknowledge the fact that they don't like Star Wars anymore and it's not for them and just move on because we're sick of hearing it from you, okay? Um, so back then, they changed the rules of an aspect of the Force and I didn't hear people complaining about it. They're like, oh, that's really awesome. There are other dimensions of this galaxy that we had not thought of before. And so, you know, get over it, people, really. Um, the uh, Nagri... Uh, the sort of assassins uh, that uh, Darth Vader and then Thrawn employed um, uh, to target Jedi. Um, this final encounter at Mount Tantus where Luke has to, spoiler alert, has to fight a clone of himself uh, that the Emperor had uh, created to uh, uh, 
uh, challenge uh, created from essentially from his hand in uh, Empire Strikes Back. Equipment and droids, all the new sorts of vehicles. The ATPT was first brought out in the Thrawn trilogy. Starships, lots of new starships, because there was this whole segment of this trilogy that was based upon them uh, getting some Clone War dreadnoughts to fight uh, Thrawn's armada, and they all uh, connected the ships together with slave circuitry, so this giant fleet could be called the Katana Fleet. So this giant fleet could be commanded by only certain by only certain people or a small number of people. Okay, so that was like a new technological aspect. Uh, space defense stations compared to a Star Destroyer, you know, pretty big. Interdictor cruisers were first used in the Thrawn trilogy, and that now they have been and become an established part of Star Wars lore. Star Cruise, Mon Calamari Star Cruisers. The Strike Class Cruiser was a modular Imperial spacecraft that was used uh, by, to great effect by Thrawn. All sorts of fun... I, I've always really been interested in Star Wars spaceships. It's been a huge thing. The Lady Luck, Talon Cards, Infamous Lot Yacht. Uh, in the Thrawn trilogy, I think that one of the ways that Luke Skywalker infiltrated a location is that he uh, he gutted out a Troc freighter and put his Starfighter in it so that he could sneak into a location. And then, you know, some interesting tactics that you could use in the game, but also different battles that were present that were written about in the novel. And so, you know, you can tell from the condition of this book that I've read it and reread it. And it's, it's just a really uh, important aspect of my role playing hobby over time. And so I wanted to share that with everybody, especially since some of the viewers of this video, um, I've been involved in a, a 10 year old uh, D20 and then Saga edition version of Star Wars role playing. We haven't moved over to the Final Fantasy, uh, the the uh, <laughs> to the uh, uh, Fantasy Flight Games version of Star Wars uh, because you know we we have what we need. So you know why at this stage why switch over? But this is where it all started for me in terms of Star Wars role playing. This is some of the earliest role playing that I did. So I wanted to showcase that for everybody. And so uh, this channel exists because it's a fun outlet for me for my role-playing game hobby. And, you know, a lot of my friends are scattered all over the country. And I want to be able to keep in touch with them with regards to, you know, what's going on with me for gaming. And there's going to continue to be, you know, a lot of uh, a wide variety of role-playing games that I'd like to feature here on the channel. But Call of Cthulhu is my main role-playing game. And so you'll expect to see a lot of Call of Cthulhu stuff uh, moving forward. But, you know, that's just where my collecting interest is. And so thanks for watching. Have a great day.